Alright, hi everyone. I hope this video finds you well. Hope you're taking care. So, I've been trying to get these videos posted as soon as possible. So this video that you're watching right now is the video for the week of April 6th. So if you are watching this video but you have not yet completed exam 3, if exam 3 is still open, please make sure that you do that because this video that we're doing today is going to start the material for the last section of the class. So I would definitely recommend doing exam 3 first before you move on to the material for the last section. So there is an activity associated with uh, this particular lecture video. It's going to be due by 5 p.m. on April 10th. But remember that these activities are already open. So if you would like to work ahead, you have the opportunity to do so. One thing to say is that you do get two drop grades for activities. So I'm only going to keep your top 10 activities which means that if you've gotten full credit on the first 10, then you can essentially not do the last two, just not essentially, just don't do the last two, because you get zeros on them and they would be dropped because I drop your two lowest activity grades. I mean, feel free to complete them if you would like to, but if you had uh, missed earlier activities or not gotten full credit on them, then activities 11 and 12 would give you a chance to earn some points back. Let me know if you have any questions about that. So looking at this last section of the class, today's lecture is going to talk about biological, psychological, and social issues in middle adulthood. And then moving forward, we'll talk about issues as people get older. We'll start off talking about physical, cognitive, mental health issues. So this is going to be one video, but then for that week we're going to have another video, um, social issues in later life as well. And then, I'm sorry, there's no other way to end human growth and development class than with a lecture on dying and bereavement. So we've got that to look forward to. All right, so if you have any questions about anything uh, coming up, please feel free to let me know. Now we're going to go ahead and get into lecture. All right, so as I said, today we're going to be talking about middle adulthood. Now, when we've been talking about different phases of life, we haven't always had a firm number as far as when this period of life starts, but according to your textbook, middle adulthood, middle age would start around age 40. Now one thing to note is that with advances in healthcare, people taking better care of themselves, people are living longer, and so as our life expectancy changes, what we consider to be middle age will likely change a bit as well, but we're going to stick around with this number 40. You'll definitely start noticing some, some changes in your appearance. It talks about some examples here, wrinkles, gray hair, baldness. But one thing to note is that when it comes to things like gray hair and baldness, losing your hair, a lot of this is genetic. And so certainly there are some younger individuals that have gray hair or losing hair at a very young age. There may be some individuals that are up into their 70s before they start having gray hair. So a lot of this is genetic. It talks about male pattern baldness, once again, being a genetic trait. And if someone has this genetic trait, this could start during uh, young adulthood, so not necessarily during middle adulthood. One thing that you'll see is that people often have a slower metabolism as they get older. So when you're younger, for, uh, for some individuals, you're able to not think as much about your diet because your metabolism is so high um, that your body is burning through those calories very quickly. But as you get older and your metabolism slows down, many people end up gaining weight. And so this might be a time period where people start to be um, more conscious of things like exercise and diet. When we're talking about your bones and joints, this is definitely something to keep an eye on during middle adulthood. So your peak in a lot of health-related issues is probably around 20 or in your 20s. When it talks about skeletal maturity, your bone mass is at its peak around 19 and 20. Uh, and then you're going to see this declining a little bit as you get older. It talks about for women around the age of menopause, which we're going to be talking about menopause coming up. Uh, but there are some hormonal changes here that can cause bone mass to decrease, uh, as well as for men who obviously don't go through menopause, but later in life can have some decrease in bone mass as well. So it is important to make sure that you're getting calcium, whether you're getting that through your diet or through supplements, making sure that you are doing that. 
um, osteoporosis is something that is um, very um, unfortunate and in a lot of cases can cause a lot of pain, a lot of injury. Uh, just referring to a disease where the bones become weakened and then injury is much more likely. We see that osteoporosis is more likely in women and this could potentially be because of uh, hormonal issues but then also possibly because of what women's bodies go through with uh, pregnancy and lactation uh, could also potentially be a drain on a woman's resources. So um, during pregnancy and lactation, or when I say lactation, I mean breastfeeding, um, that's a very important time to make sure that you're getting uh, your calcium supplements. So some other things that can be happening with bones, uh, arthritis. Now people use the term arthritis kind of generally speaking, there are multiple types of arthritis. So when you think about older individuals who are struggling from pain in their joints, uh, usually we're thinking about osteoarthritis here. So this is a degenerative disease. It's going to get worse over time because of overuse or injury. Uh, and it affects different people differently. Um, but usually with osteoarthritis, things like your hands are usually some of the first things that start to have pain. Uh, but it can also be in your back, so with your spine, hips, and knees. Um, typically, we do not see osteoarthritis impacting certain parts like wrists, elbows, shoulders, or ankles. Those are not usually involved with osteoarthritis. But you can imagine if your hands, your, your back, your hips, your knees are hurting, then it can be very difficult for you to exercise or to be active or to do most you know, everyday things. And so this is something that people often seek out treatment for. Um, there are medications that we can do here. Um, when it talks about exercise, exercise is great, but obviously can be painful. So non-stressful exercise. Sometimes people do things like exercising in a swimming pool, swimming, that kind of thing that uh, helps support your body while you're exercising. And your doctor may recommend some changes in your diet as well. But as I said, there are other types of arthritis. So osteoarthritis is usually that type of arthritis that comes with older age where a person has used their joints excessively. Rheumatoid arthritis is something that can happen in older individuals, but it's also possible for it to happen in younger individuals as well. So it talks about this being a slowly developing disease. Um, basically, you have pain and swelling in your joints that can occur at any point in time, not necessarily related to injury or to overuse. So we don't at the moment have a cure for rheumatoid arthritis, um, which is unfortunate, especially when we see this happening in very young individuals. Um, there are some medications that we can give that can help with the symptoms, uh, but the individual may have to uh, deal with this as a lifelong problem. All right. What about some reproductive changes? I told you that we were going to be talking about menopause today. This entire lecture is about middle adulthood, so 40 plus. Um, one thing to mention about being 40 plus, it is possible for an individual to still um, mother or father children during this time. So uh, briefly mentioning some differences with fertility here, uh, men have more years of fertility. Men can continue to father children uh, much later in life, although as a man gets older, his fertility does decrease somewhat. And there's some research to suggest that there's an increased risk of some genetic disorders and things if an individual is uh, older when he fathers a child. But for women, there are um, fairly narrow years in which a woman is able to conceive a child. Now, uh, it is possible for a woman to have uh, a baby after 40 uh, if she has not reached menopause yet. Um, menopause is something that happens, we're going to see this in a second, primarily based on genetics as far as when this starts. So sometimes women are having children later in life, um, but that would be a high-risk pregnancy um, for a couple of reasons. One is because as a mother gets older, her body is not in as good a shape, so there are health risks associated for mom. Um, but then also as a mother gets older, um, the eggs... Uh, potentially might have deteriorated a bit. There's a, an increased risk for a genetic issue with baby. So someone might still be having children in middle adulthood, but there is an increased risk there, and a pregnancy during middle adulthood is probably going to be monitored um, much more closely than a pregnancy earlier in life. All right, so 
At some point, though, you're going to pass from reproductive to non-reproductive years. So we're going to transition out of um, that fertile time period. Uh, perimenopause is where a woman will transition from having uh, her regular monthly period. Um, for those who have regular monthly periods, not everyone does. There are some uh, situations where a woman doesn't. But if you've been having whatever cycle you've been having, um, this is going to gradually stop. It usually doesn't stop all at once. So a woman might have a period every few months, perhaps, and have them very irregularly before she actually goes into menopause. So once again, this is likely genetic in when it starts and how long it takes. But you will see some hormonal changes here, especially estrogen and progesterone are decreasing during this time period. Uh, so these changes are primarily uh, driven by hormonal changes. And these hormone levels that are changing are going to be responsible for lots of different symptoms. And so likely you've, you've heard of these. You've had women um, talk about having things like hot flashes. Usually hot flashes is the thing you, you hear about most, but there are lots of symptoms that can be associated with menopause. Um, it talks about mood changes, headaches. You can see what's listed here. Uh, sleep issues can also become a problem. So you can imagine how stressful this would be for a woman to be having some maybe psychological changes, sleeping issues, uh, and also changes to her sex life. So it talks about low libido, which we're referring to interest in uh, sexual activity. Uh, and sexual activity might be painful um, because of these changes in hormones. So you can see that there are a wide variety of issues that can come along with menopause. Now, uh, some of these could potentially be treated. Doctors might have medications, uh, something to help a woman kind of balance her hormone levels. Uh, but then some of this may just be something you have to kind of wait out uh, for menopause to pass. So other issues that are happening during middle adulthood, stress. We are usually during middle adulthood at the peak of our careers, as well as perhaps right in the middle of uh, family life. So if people are, most people are getting married in their late 20s uh, and maybe having kids a few years after, then when you're around the age of 40, you have some elementary school age kids on average, uh, and then also probably at the peak of your career. So definitely stress is happening. Uh, it talks about being more stressed out when you feel like you have little control over your job. So part of this could be control over your schedule and how much time you spend at work, but also when you're at work, do you have any kind of input into decisions that are being made, that kind of thing. So uh, work and family related matters are usually what's on an individual's mind during this time period. Uh, as individuals get older, they're more likely to say that it's health issues they're concerned about. That may be because as they get older, they're likely to be heading towards retirement, so career doesn't seem as big of an issue. Usually their kids are getting older and more independent, but then also health issues are more likely to be coming up during this age range. Now, one thing that you'll see when you ask men and women around this time, what is it that stresses you out? Um, they'll usually say daily hassles, you know, the day-to-day -day trying to get through uh, kinds of things. But when you ask more you'll see that women are more likely to mention family and health related issues. Men are more likely to mention financial and work related issues. So this is interesting, I think, because women are more likely than ever to be working outside of the home now. So even though women are working outside of the home, they're still less likely to say that they are concerned about financial and work related issues. This could be because of um, kind of the gender norms where we expect men to be financial providers, perhaps. Um, we expect women to be more of the uh, nurturers at home, even though um, both partners may be contributing in both areas. All right, so this is an interesting and somewhat ironic slide for me to ask my college students if they know what stress feels like. I'm sure you know what stress feels like, but let's have a good definition here. Basically, stress is made up of two components. It's made up of the event that is stressing you out, as well as your response to that event. So two people can go through the exact same event and have different levels of stress because of their response to the event. If you feel like you have the resources to deal with the stressful situation, then it won't impact you as much. If you feel like you have the time, the energy, the finances, then although it may be an unfortunate situation, you'll be less stressed out by it. 
Having said that though, sometimes we have something happen to us and we feel like we don't have the resources to be able to deal with that and that's when we feel the most stressed out. So it's a fantastic time for you guys to start honing your stress coping skills. You need to learn how to handle stressful situations if you're thinking about moving on towards grad school or even career or whatever you're going to do after college, it is important for you to learn how to handle stress. Not just because stress is bad for your physical health, but it's also not great for your relationships as well. So it talks about some different thoughts on coping here. Um, emotion versus problem focused coping. I think we've mentioned this previously when we we're talking about how to handle unemployment, uh, but problem focused coping is usually most helpful. So. If there's a stressful situation, then you need to figure out how to deal with that stressful situation. I do want you to handle your emotions. That's fantastic. But if you only handle your emotions and you don't fix the stressful situation, things are only going to get worse. So you need to come up with a way to solve that problem. Also, there is a thought that it's not about what happens to you, but it is your way of processing your attitude towards what happens to you that really dictates whether or not you're stressed out. For example, you could have two different students that both fail the same test. But one student who fails that test says, uh, my life is over, I'm never going to be able to be successful, I'm going to fail out of school. The other student says, I messed up. Next time I'll study more, I'll try harder, I'll ask questions, whatever. That student will probably be less stressed out and more successful in the future because they're problem focused here. They're trying to change what happened that caused the stressful situation to begin with. And then also having uh, religious beliefs, uh, spirituality here is something that people often list as something that helps them cope with stress. Uh, if you have uh, religious beliefs, this can be really helpful for you, uh, in part because of the religious beliefs themselves, but also because perhaps this means that you are connected with other people who have similar beliefs and can be a support system for you. All right, what about exercise? We know that exercise is important, um, but what should we be doing when we're exercising? So there is some information down here about the ideal, what adults should be doing. Uh, I would wager a guess to say the majority of you guys are probably not meeting these uh, goals. And also, I feel like it should be fair, I mean, I should be fair here and tell you, I haven't been inside of a gym since 2008, I don't think. And I do chase around children, and I feel like that counts as exercise. But um, we should all probably do better uh, taking care of our physical health. But when you're exercising, you're going to have the most benefits if you get your heart rate in an ideal place. So it talks about maintaining a pulse rate between 60 to 90 percent of your maximum heart rate. So you can Google this. There are formulas. I think your maximum heart rate is something like 220 minus your age. And it's important to take into account your age because um, older individuals may not be able to or may not be advised to exercise as strenuously as younger individuals would. Um, but then once you have 220 minus your age, that might tell you your maximum heart rate. And then you need to figure out 60 to 90% of that. I would say if you are not exercising regularly, you're going to want to start off definitely on the lower end of that and move upwards with caution. Um, but maintaining that appropriate pulse rate can help you make sure that you're getting the maximum benefits from your exercise. So I hope that you guys are taking good care of yourself, exercising, eating breakfast, you know, sleeping whenever you can. Other issues to be thinking about, um, we've talked this semester about biological development. We've also talked about cognitive development, so a change in our thought processes. So intelligence. There are lots of different definitions for intelligence, and remember that it is important how we define intelligence because this impacts what we put on our intelligence tests. Um, but when we're talking about intelligence, some individuals would conceptualize this as an ability to solve real-world problems, which is a very practical view of intelligence. The idea that your intellectual skills are only useful to you if you can use them to adapt to your environment. Now, then the question is, with our intelligence test, are we actually having people do something that tests for practical intelligence? Are they having to solve real-world problems and adapt to their environment? Which is another conversation for another day. But practical intelligence is obviously very important during your day-to-day -day life. So with practical intelligence, this is something that is going to be changing a little bit as you get older. 
So it talks about practical intelligence depending on experience. Well, we know that for most of us, you get that experience as you get older. Sure, some individuals get experience at a younger age, and some individuals are older and still not able to solve problems. I understand that. But on average, as you get older, you have more experience. And that's an important part of your practical intelligence. It also talks about your preferred mode of thinking. So some people just in general enjoy thinking more. Um, there's a desire for um, cognitive effort. Some people relax by doing Sudoku and crossword puzzles, right? So there are different types of thinking, ways of thinking here. But it also talks about emotional response. So some people are high on emotional intelligence. They're able to understand their emotions and use their emotions as fuel to actually help them make better decisions and perform better. Um, but for the majority of us, when you're very emotional, it makes it harder to solve a problem and to think practically here. So when there is a problem, you can take a few different approaches. You can focus on the issue. You have to conceptualize the problem, think of different strategies, different potential solutions, weigh the pros and cons, try out that solution. If it doesn't work, go back to the drawing board, come up with another solution. Some individuals will say, okay, this problem needs to be solved, but I don't want to be the one to think of the solution. So when it talks about being passive or dependent here, this is basically the, I don't know, you tell me what to do, expecting someone else to help them solve the problem. Um, certainly some people are a little bit more indecisive than others, but this is definitely a problem, uh, especially if you don't have someone around to help you solve the issue. And then some people try to pretend that there's not a problem at all. Obviously that's not going to go well. And that's associated with anxiety. People who are anxious tend to be more avoidant of issues that make them anxious. All right. So I think that we've mentioned this before, the idea that there are different types of intelligence that as one of them is going up, the other one is going down. So when it talks about mechanics versus pragmatics, I mean, pragmatic is a practical. So when we're talking about pragmatic intelligence, you are collecting information. This is crystallized intelligence. So this is going up. This is increasing with age. You learn more practical information from living your everyday life. You're learning something new every day. You have learned from experience. Maybe something you've done in the past has not worked, and then you've had to fix it. And so you gain your crystallized intelligence as you get older. This is the accumulated wisdom that a person has. But then as your crystallized intelligence is going up, fluid intelligence is going down. The mechanics of actually being able to work through the problem. So it talks here about your neurophysiological architecture. What does that mean? Well, basically when we talk about fluid intelligence, your ability to think quickly and abstractly, your ability to process information is going to be decreasing with age. So older individuals will have a little more issues with memory, usually on average. Um, they won't be able to think through things as quickly, which means that they will approach problems in a different way than a younger individual would, but not necessarily in an inferior way. Uh, they have more wisdom, they have more knowledge, so as crystallized intelligence is going up, fluid intelligence is going down, and so there's a different way of solving problems here. Now, when it talks about becoming an expert, there are different definitions of what it means to be an expert. But oftentimes, we think of an expert as being someone who has experience. They've accumulated experience. So you could be an expert at your career, but you could also be an expert in a hobby or expert in uh, interpersonal relations, you know, dealing with other people or understanding your own emotions. You're an expert in something. Usually this peaks in middle age. And that's because you have, during middle age, this sweet spot where your fluid intelligence has not decreased very much hopefully, but your crystallized intelligence has increased. So it talks about encapsulation here. This is the process where you are able to do something better and better, and at the same time use less energy to do it. So an expert is able to do something really well, but they make it look easy because of the experience they have. Like for example, I don't know if you guys watch um, a lot of cooking shows, but if you watch someone cooking or if you watch someone who's baking cakes and they've been baking cakes for years and they're like piping roses out of icing and like I could never do that, but they do it without any kind of effort whatsoever. They're doing a great job with very little effort 
and that means they have become an expert, right? So this allows them to compensate for that decline in fluid intelligence because they have so much experience. And as they are learning new information when they're younger, because this expertise probably started several years before middle age, they're accumulating all that information while their brain is developing. It's like you're specializing in something. And this results in implicit knowledge, which basically means it becomes easy. So for example, when you first started driving a car, you probably had to try really hard. You had to pay attention to everything. Maybe you were easily distracted. Well, some of us are easily distracted now, but that's besides the point. But when you had been driving a car for years, you leave work and then you're home and maybe you don't even remember the drive home because it was so automatic for you. I don't know if you've had that experience. It's a little bit scary, but the point is it's become implicit. You don't even have to think about it. So you have become an expert driver perhaps uh, because it's implicit, it's easy for you. All right. So when we're talking about intelligence and in crystallized in a crystallized intelligence increasing as you get older, this means that we're continuing to accumulate knowledge. We're continuing to learn throughout the lifespan. And this is huge. We often think about um, childhood and adolescence and then maybe early adulthood. We think when we graduate from college, we're done learning. No, not at all. I have learned so much since I graduated college and part of that is from homeschooling my kids and part of that is from teaching you guys and part of that is just from being curious, just reading articles and, and making sure that I'm still learning every day. But to maintain your job, you may have to do some continued education. Even if you're not required to do this, I still encourage you to continue to learn throughout your life. It's really good for your brain. Now, sometimes older individuals uh, will take classes that they don't have to take just because they're interested, or maybe they do need to take them to try to learn some new skills for the workplace. Uh, one thing that you'll see about older individuals, they're more likely to want to be able to apply information. So not necessarily wanting that abstract philosophical discussion, but hey, what can I do with this information? Obviously, they have experience that they bring with them to the classroom and tend to be more intrinsically than extrinsically motivated, not just there to get a grade, but there because they genuinely want to learn. Uh, over the course of my teaching, I have had several uh, non-traditional students, older individuals in my classrooms, and it's always been really interesting. It's been a really good experience, especially in an in-person class uh, where we can have discussion to hear from different viewpoints. I really enjoy that when I'm teaching. All right, if we're going to be talking about your development, then we obviously need to talk about your personality because personality is something that develops over time. Uh, personality is one of those things where we understand what it means, but it's very difficult to define. We think of a personality as something that makes us who we are, something that is relatively unique and relatively consistent over time, even though our personality can adapt, which we'll talk about in a second. There have been lots of different attempts to define personality, but um, the five-factor model is one that you hear about a lot because there's a lot of research to support it. This is the idea that there are five major components to your personality, and then you're either high or low on each of these. And so that all combined together will define your personality. So essentially, we're boiling down this very complex concept of personality to five major traits. And there may be some minor traits here, but they would really go underneath one of these kind of a sub trait. So essentially, we're summing up with five factors here. So I like putting them in this order so you can maybe remember them because of the acronym OCEAN. Um, but openness to experience, I think that's fairly straightforward. If you're open to experience, you want to try new things, you might ask yourself questions like, do I go to new places? When I go to a restaurant, do I order different food every time? Uh, am I a spontaneous person? I would definitely say that I am low on openness to experience. I like to have a plan. I like to stick with the plan. I always order the same thing. All right, uh, conscientiousness refers to a person being responsible, essentially dependable. So with conscientiousness, this is a person that is making sure that they're taking care of their responsibilities, they're planning ahead, they are paying their bills on time, they're doing their work. Um, so I would say I'm relatively high on conscientiousness. 
Um, extroversion is one that people misunderstand a lot. Sometimes people think that if you are an introvert, then that means you don't want to be around people. Not necessarily. Introverts need social interaction too. I think one of the best ways to describe this is that an extrovert is someone who is able to best relax and be themselves when they are around other people. An introvert is someone who feels like they are able to relax and be themselves when they are alone or around like a small core group of people. Um, so it really has to do with how best you relax and where you're most comfortable. Um, but if you're high on extroversion, you enjoy being around other people as much as possible. Uh, if you're low on extroversion, that's essentially saying that you're introverted. Uh, I would say personally I'm more on the introverted side of things. As far as agreeableness goes, I feel like this is relatively straightforward. Do you get along well with other people? I don't know, I may be middle of the road on agreeableness. And then with neuroticism, this is another word that people sometimes misunderstand. Um, neurotic basically means that a person is emotionally unstable. So a person who's high in neuroticism might be very angry, uh, moody, but it could also be a person who's very anxious. Uh, and so then therefore, because of the anxious thing, I would say that I tend to be higher on neuroticism, but I take Zoloft, so that's very helpful for my neuroticism. Um, but yes, emotionally unstable is what we're talking about with neuroticism. All right, very good. How does your personality change over time? It talks about longitudinal studies where you're following the same people over time to see how they change as they age. Um, one thing, we haven't gotten to the uh, later time period. We haven't talked about elderly individuals yet. But one thing that we see when we're looking at personalities in older individuals, higher levels of suspiciousness and sensitivity. This may or may not be a surprise to you. More on that when we talk about older individuals. But this is interesting. Neuroticism and extroversion decrease as we grow older. I think that the extroversion thing makes sense. Uh, perhaps as you get older, maybe you're more tired, you have more health concerns, um, going out and doing things may be a little bit more difficult for you. But I think that neuroticism decreasing, first of all, is true. Research has supported this. And second of all, can be a really great thing. A lot of psychological disorders get better as you get older. You might think that a person is more anxious or more depressed as they get older um, because maybe they have health issues or they're essentially closer to death, but that's not the case. Older individuals are usually happier than younger individuals, right? And one thing to note is that a key component of a personality disorder is an inability to adapt. So we're essentially saying that you should be flexible with your personality to a certain degree. Your personality is not likely to change drastically, but you should be able to adapt a little bit based on your environment. All right. What about your priorities in middle life? Remember we talked about Erickson and Erickson had this idea that we go through different life stages where we have different things that are going on. Well, during middle adulthood, we have this generativity versus stagnation. The idea that if you're successful here, then you pass on something to the next generation that is useful to them. Uh, if you're not successful, you have the stagnation where either you have people in your life that need you to pass on something and you don't do it successfully, or you just don't have anyone in your life that needs you to pass on something. Which then leads us to the question, do you have to have kids to successfully navigate this stage? No, not necessarily. If you don't have kids, during middle adulthood, you still need to find a way to give back, but you could volunteer. You could take care of other people. You could help others. It doesn't have to be children necessarily. You might have um, some people that you're close to through uh, church services or people in your neighborhood, people that you help out with, uh, or some kind of volunteering. So you can definitely do this even if you don't have your own children. But uh, stagnation is something that people often look back on as they end their life. Uh, as they get closer to the end of life and say, I wish I had spent more time pouring into others, making a difference, uh, leaving something, a, a legacy essentially. So when I talk about middle adulthood, perhaps the first thing that came to your mind was a midlife crisis. Well, midlife crisis is not a universal experience. Not everyone experiences a midlife crisis. Although some people, as you'll see on the slide, uh, have a midlife correction so during this middle period of your life, 
you have enough wisdom perhaps to see where you should make changes and you still have enough energy left and time left to make those changes. So this is a good idea to reevaluate uh, your priorities as you get older. When it talks about ego resilience here, basically are you able to cope with the stress that people are feeling during middle adulthood? And being able to be resilient here and cope with stress makes it much more likely that you're able to take care of other people and to pass on a legacy to another generation. You have to be able to take care of yourself before you can take care of other people. But this is a stressful time period. Why is middle adulthood stressful? Well, we already mentioned this can be a peak of career time, but this can also be a very busy time in your personal life. Um, and you're going to see coming up taking care of your kids, but not just your kids, but then also aging family members as well. So a lot of stressful things happening during this time span. This is where you see the sandwich generation, the idea that you might still have children that need your care and at the same time have maybe parents or other aging family members, um, maybe even perhaps grandparents or aunts and uncles, other people that might need your help. So who is going to be taking care of the kids? Who is going to be taking care of family members? Who keeps the family together? Well, stereotypically, we think about mothers. When we ask men and women about their priorities, women are more likely to say that one-on-one -on -one relationships are more important to them. And perhaps that's part of the reason why women tend to be the kin keeper here, the person who makes sure that the family gets together and stays in touch. Um, perhaps this is the social norm that we expect this of women and we don't expect this of men. Um, certainly this could be a male family member, this could be father, grandfather, or whatever, but typically it is a mother who is doing this. And as you get older, you have changes in your relationships with your children if you have children. Now, part of this depends on when you had kids. And I had kids very young. And there are good things as well as bad things about that. But one advantage I think, or I'm hoping to that, is that by the time my kids are old enough to be independent, maybe I'll still be young enough to enjoy it a little bit. Um, but when we're talking here about an empty nest, some people may not have an empty nest during uh, middle adulthood. I mean, my mother was 39 when she gave birth to me. So obviously she did not have an empty nest at 40. Um, so different people have different experiences here. But as children start to leave the home, that can lead to a change in their relationship. So on the one hand, children might see their parents in a more positive light. Uh, sometimes when you live with your parents and they are always there and maybe always telling you what to do, it makes it harder on a relationship. But when you leave Sometimes you can look back and say, there was some wisdom there, or I miss my parents. I wish someone would come and do my laundry. So maybe as you get older, you see your parents in a more positive light. But one thing you can also see is that women might be very depressed by the, the idea of children moving, uh, moving outside of the home. Women often see motherhood as being a major component of their, their role, their personality, who they are. So this can be a really stressful time period for them, but maybe they don't need to worry because maybe the kids will come back. So boomerang kids. Um, this is becoming more and more common that young adults are moving back home. Uh, perhaps this is because of the financial costs of uh, becoming independent, of uh, paying for school, student loans, that kind of thing. So kids might move out, go to college, and then when they graduate, they might move back in. And maybe this is just until they get on their feet financially or until they get married, that kind of thing, which is different from culture to culture. But one thing that we do see is that when children move back home, it may be because they've struggled to develop their own independence here, maybe having school problems, having financial problems, just not having a lot of uh, independence or not knowing how to handle independence can lead kids to moving back home makes me think about that failure to launch movie, right? I don't know. It's been a while, but it was semi-entertaining anyway. All right, so in addition to taking care of your kids, you may also be taking care of older parents here. Um, this is something that can create a lot of stress on a family, um, trying to navigate what are we going to do as parents get older. So we definitely see the daughters or daughters-in-law are more likely to be providing care. So this is saying that a woman may be taking care of her parents as well as her husband's parents. 
um, which can obviously be very stressful in addition to being expected to uh, take on more child care as well. So one thing that makes this difficult is that the parent that now needs care uh, may resist this because they are used to being independent, they like being independent, and there can be a little bit of a power struggle. When you're an adult and your parent moves back home, it's hard, or your parent moves into your home, it's hard to negotiate then who is in charge now because you're used to your parent being in charge, but now you're an adult and so there's this power dynamic that can be uh, very difficult. So you might have actually a physical responsibility, helping your parents physically, or maybe financially taking care of your parents, um, which is really stressful. So then this leads to your activity for this lecture video, activity 10. Um, remember there are 12 activities, this is activity 10. What are your thoughts on children caring for their elderly parents? So this is something that we don't see as much in our culture. In our culture, individualistic culture, we're more likely to say that an older individual goes to like a retirement home, that kind of thing. But what are your thoughts on maybe having the parent move in with you and your family as they get older? What could be some good things and what could be some bad things about that? So you may or may not have personal experience. Maybe you watch your parents taking care of their parents. Um, but just your general thoughts on the topic for Activity 10. All right, which is going to be due by Friday at 5 p.m. Okay, so when we're talking about caregiving, this can be a stressful time because we're at maybe the peak of our career and then also taking care of kids and family members as well. Um, this can definitely impact a woman, especially because women tend to be more likely to be taking care of family members and kids. Having said all of that, women often feel like they want to or they need to take care of their family members even if they have a lot of work stress going on anyway. And a benefit here is that there can be a feeling of intimacy. Maybe you feel closer to your parents uh, because you're getting to spend this special time with them. But then also there's a burnout here. Um, being a caregiver is hard, uh, especially if you're being a caregiver to multiple individuals. Maybe you have young kids and older individuals that you're trying to help out with. And this can definitely cause burnout and could potentially harm your relationship with your parents if they don't appreciate what you're doing if they're not used to being dependent on someone, this can definitely be difficult. As you can imagine, this can also impact your work. So if a woman has to take a lot of time off of work to try to help out with family members, um, then that could cause her to lose her job or to not be considered for promotions, that kind of thing. So then one of the last things to be thinking about, um, we're talking about having older individuals move in with you and maybe with your children, you think about grandparenting. So there are a couple of different ways to think about this. On the one hand, grandparents have wisdom that they've developed throughout the years and may be able to pass on things like family history. So there may be information about other relatives that you don't know or that you just haven't thought of to share with your kids. And so grandparents could pass on that information um, that later in life they may wish that they knew. On the other hand, it may also be helpful for grandparents to spend time around grandchildren if they help them learn new skills uh, and help them perhaps, especially with technology, which is stereotypical, right? Who hasn't helped their grandparents set up their you know, remote or computer or phone or whatever the case may be. So there's definitely some benefits to spending time around your grandkids as well. A lot of individuals say that grandparenting is very important for them. Maybe they view this as a chance for them to correct mistakes that they made the first time around as a parent. Um, and one thing that we see here, it talks about providing wisdom and indulging. This can be the case. Sometimes grandparents struggle uh, with following the parents' guidelines about appropriate you know, rules and structure in life, and that can be something to keep in mind. Um, but sometimes also it does lead an individual to kind of reminisce about their childhood and relationships that they have with their grandparents, and they view this as a very uh, special time for them. Uh, but one thing to be keeping in mind here is that there are differences from culture to culture as far as grandparenting is concerned. I think in the South, we tend to have an idea of grandparents being more involved, perhaps, uh, but this varies from place to place. Uh, some individuals uh, feel like they are a fill-in for adults, especially if they don't have 
the parent there anymore, which we're going to talk about grandparenting in a second as far as the grandparent being the parent, um, but definitely can feel like they need to step in um, and take up responsibility here. And then in some situations, um, the grandparent is responsible for passing on the culture. It talks about Native Americans being an example here, where an older individual passes on the wisdom, the tribal customs, uh, which would be a grandparent, but could also be another uh, older individual in the community. Keeping that in mind, a couple of different things. For one thing, people are more mobile these days and more likely to move. Therefore, some grandparents may live farther away from their children and their grandchildren, but then also um, sometimes grandparents are the primary caregiver, which might happen because the parents pass away or because for some reason they're not capable of taking care of the kids. Um, this can be stressful because older individuals may have less income, um, may have less energy, may be dealing with their own health problems. And so one thing that we see is that children who are being raised by their grandparents tend to have more difficulties on average. Of course, this varies from situation to situation, but we can see uh, the grandparents might struggle a little bit more with things like discipline uh, and maybe helping kids with schoolwork, that kind of thing. And so we do see some negative uh, associations with this on average, but of course this doesn't necessarily define every single situation. All right, so lots of information about middle adulthood. Remember that you do have activity 10. Let me know if you have any questions about that. Otherwise, I will talk to you guys during your next, next lecture video. Have a great day.